Uh, I was going to say thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome to our church. Uh, I hope you all learned something today. <laughs> uh, right after, I'm going to do a quick prayer and then we'll get right into it. All right? Dear Lord, we come to you today. I want to say thank you for allowing us all to be here to uh, honor you, worship you. Uh, learn something from you, Lord. We all want to get closer to you, and this is the way we do it. All of this as a family here to, uh, you know, be in your name, praise you. Uh, thank you once again. We are in honor you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
So I thought I'd get to come up here and sing. Amen. 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 All right, so I'm going to need everybody to participate in on this song. Um, so feel free to clap, move around, get yourself some space. We're going to have some fun in the Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.
And I get excited when I think about what God has done in my life and how he has transformed me. You see, those words are not just merely words. They're an experience. They're a relationship with a living and true God this morning. And we're talking about receiving the living water. That's the message today we're going to talk about. Receiving that living water that Jesus gives. Amen? Amen. Uh, as we get ready for this school year, we saw this video earlier. I want to watch all our students, our teachers, parents, and parents today. Um, because uh, as they start this new school year, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of stuff we have to adapt to. Wearing the mask, social distancing, some of the classrooms only have six, seven kids. Um, you know, and the little toddlers, they don't understand that. They're looking forward to their playtime. And they're looking forward to greeting their friends and all that stuff. And they won't understand that. So pray that God will help them to walk through that. Amen. So this morning, we're going to be looking at living water receiving that living water and we're going to come from a very familiar passage of scripture we're going to come from a very familiar passage of scripture this morning talking about living water and we think here Jesus Christ on his way to the city and he's given he made it a purpose he intentionally went somewhere so he can give this living water to someone who is of a need so, uh, this one here, we can't blame it on Corona. <laughs> you know, I could easily say, well, Corona did it. Uh, corona caused the mic to not want to work this morning. But we trust God that you will get what you need to hear today as we go through the word. Amen? Amen. So the expression of living water today can be defined with many meanings. And in most contexts... Living water simply means flowing water. If you've ever been in a desert environment and you've been thirsty and you come across some water, it's so refreshing and refreshing to your soul. But the water we are talking about today is the eternal water. It's the Spirit of God dwelling in us that allow us to be in relationship that will take us from this life to the next. And that's what Jesus Christ is talking about. And that's what we're going to look at today. Come receive the living water. Wherever you are today in your circumstance of life, whatever is going on, if you have not received, Jesus is here right now. And he's still saying, if you will only ask, I'll give it. And he is still offering that water today. Let's turn in our Bible this morning to John chapter 4. So in John chapter 4, it says, And he had to pass through Samaria. So Jesus was on his way from Judea to Galilee. And he decided to go through Samaria. Now, for those of us who have looked up on the region and see that area around and know a little bit of history, you know as a Jew, Jews don't have any dealing with Samarian, Samaritans, right? And so for most Jews, especially rabbis, they wouldn't even have gone that route. They would have taken the long route around just so they wouldn't have to deal with those people because that's how they look at them. And there's a lot of history here with us between the Samaritans and the Jews. But Jesus made it his business to go through Samaritan because there's someone that needed to get saved that day. And it just wasn't that one person. It was a city that was turned upside down. Because once she received, she went and got the city. It's not how it is in Jesus Christ when we find something good. When God has done a work in our life, we want to share that with someone else, don't we? We want to go and tell someone, come and see. Look what the Lord has done. He changed my mind. He healed my body. It was right on time. It was no coincidence that Jesus went through Samaritan, Samaria. But there's so much going on here because this woman also... Most ladies come in the cool of the day to draw the water. 
But this lady that the story is talking about, she was there in the middle of the day at noon, right? So she was there at a time when most women would not. But if we look at the story, we can see some reason why we could say maybe she didn't come with the other ladies. Because as the story goes on, you're going to see she had several husbands. The guy that she was living with was not her husband. So no doubt she was an outcast within an outcast. She was an outcast amongst her own people who were also outcasts. And no doubt the other ladies didn't want to have nothing to do with her because they know her lifestyle. How many of you have been there where no one wants to be around you because you've messed up? No one wants to associate with you because you are that person. And that's where, she, that's where the story picks up right here. Now, she encountered this Jewish man, Jesus Christ. And he said to her, give me some water. He asked her for some water. And the story got interesting here. Because if we were to go back in time in the U.S., maybe 40 years ago, and we go back to the South, where there was a separation and segregation, can you just picture a Caucasian guy going into a store or somewhere where it says blacks and asking a black lady and said, hey, let me get a drink of your water from your canteen. She would think, man, you're crazy. What, what, what are you doing? You're trying to get me in trouble. This is not the norm. And so she respond just the way she was supposed to respond because he's a Jew. He doesn't have any dealing with us. But yet still he's asking me for a drink of water. But look at Jesus' response. He said, if you knew, if you knew who was asking you, if you knew. So the first thing I want us to look at this morning is Jesus seeks sinners who aren't even seeking him. This woman wasn't looking for Jesus. But he went looking for her. He was there because he knew she's going to be there at that time. Jesus knew exactly where you are in your life right now. And you don't need to make some big change or prep to meet him. He's looking for you. He's going to find you right where you're at. The question is, what are you going to do when you meet him? See, many of us, people said, I can't come to church. I got to do this. I have to do this before. She didn't have time to do all of that. She was in that moment. Salvation had come to her. And she had to make a decision. Because the one who was able to save the soul, Jesus the Christ, who was getting ready to die for her sins and minds, said, hey, I'm here right now. What are you going to do? He was seeking her out. He purposely went through Samaria, took the shortest route. Can you imagine, um, I was going to try to use something, but this is the perfect one. Last weekend, um, we had uh, some friends visiting, and we wanted to go to Glenwood Cavern and enjoy those crazy, scary rides. You know, if you're not a troll seeker, you need to get on the troll seeking boat. You got to get on those roller coasters that throws you at the edge of the cliff, and you're like, Lord, there's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> if it doesn't work out, <laughs> I might see you today. <laughs> And so we were all excited because they have this one ride that sits right here at the edge. And when it propels you out, you're looking down an I-70 and the cars look like ants. And so we were just thinking about the trail of being on that ride. And we got six miles to the city and traffic comes to a hole. And we're sitting there, we're talking about the ride and which one we're going to go on first. And we're having a good time. And then the CDOT came by and the police and said, everybody needs to turn around. You got to go. The fire is coming. Ah! And uh, the brush fire had just drum, jumped across I-70 and they closed it. So the cops said, hey, you know, we told the cop what we were going to do and where they're from. And the cop said, well, if you guys want to go still, you can go back to Breckenridge, jump on 24, take 50 to 250, go to a Grand Junction and come back around and you're going to be there. It's going to cost you about six hours. And so we said, man, it's, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth the six hours for six miles. And so we turned back. 
And you see, Jesus could have done the same thing. He could have gone the long route because he didn't want to interact with those Samaritan. But the Bible said he comes for all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever included her, it includes me, it includes you. Regardless of what language you speak, your culture, your background, your ethnicity, it doesn't matter. Whosoever is for you and I. And so Jesus made it that. And he went and talked to her. See, she said, sir, you look like a Jewish rabbi. It wasn't that she was like, you know, just want to get saved. And she was like, you know, tell me about your God. No, she wasn't. Because she got religious in that moment. She started to ask him all these different things, didn't she? She started to bring up all the cultural stuff, the differences. Isn't that all we are? Sometimes we come to church and God is dealing with our hearts. But we want to tell God about all the problems and stuff. So we can justify a reason why we don't think we need to give our life to God right now. Because tomorrow which is not promise. See, she begins to walk down that road. She wasn't seeking God. Her guilt over her current living boyfriend or even her five marriage, all the way she'd been through, was probably the biggest thing in her mind. That probably what caused her from not even being with the other ladies, able to come to the well. But Jesus didn't see all of that. He saw a soul that needs to be forgiven. He saw a soul that needs to receive that living water that can transform life. Jesus said in, um, in Luke 9, 10 that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He is still seeking today men and women who desire, who will be saved. If you want to be saved, you can be saved today. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, before you leave here today, you can. It's up to you this morning. It's up to you this morning. He saved the thief on the cross. He saved the chief of sinners who were persecuting the church. We, we, we've read the story of Paul, Saul, oh God, transform his life. And he'll do the same thing in your life. He wants to offer you the gift of eternal life this morning. Now as we jump into our second point, Jesus offered all sinners you know, the gift of living water. There's three things I want us to look at here this morning. So I want you to turn your, turn your Bibles to John 4. And we're going to jump to verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is who say to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, sometimes God is doing a move and doing a work in our life. But we cannot see it because we're so caught up in our personal life, what's going on. Our circumstance, where we at right now, our pain, our struggle. So we can't see past anything else. All we can see is what's before us. But in this case, at this point in time, Jesus begins to walk with her, talking with her in that conversation. Sometimes we have to encourage folks. We have to talk with them. And that's part of doing life together as believers. Because sometimes folks need someone to talk to who will listen. Sometimes, you know, talking with someone doesn't mean you're going... No, sometimes it's just listening. Allow the person to, to share their heart and then God begin to give you the right words to respond. So in that moment, God can give you the words to comfort and lead them to salvation. But you see, you got to listen. So Jesus listen to her. And then he responded. He said, if you knew, you would ask and he would give you. One of the most spiritual er errors is that we get into heaven by our good works. You know, we do all these works. Religious stuff, biblical Christianity operation, the principles work. If we just do these things. But Romans teach us that none of what we do 
can justify or pay the debt for our sin. We need Jesus Christ to be the just pay. We need him to be the one who pay with his blood, his life. We need Jesus' sacrifice to be our justification for why we are saved, for how we got saved, because we came to Christ. So no one can say by faith alone in such a wise, mean way, or they can't say, well, if I do this, if I do this much works in the church, if I serve in this ministry, if I'm nice to these people, if I do this, but it's God who does the work in our hearts and transform it. Because we've seen people, and there's some, there's some, there's some folks out there who have lived a good life, a morally good life. That's the truth. But they're still not saved. They still don't know Jesus. Because their heart can't transform that. And we see that with people who are hurting. Because they've done everything. But they can't fill that void. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only him can make you whole. Only him can transform you on the inside. Which will then change the outside. A lot of times we try to change the outside. But the inside is still a mess. And it comes out of, our, of what we say, what we do. Because the Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So those things come out. But Jesus seeks all sinners. He gives all sinners the gift of living water. The gospel is the good news. And it keeps a bunch of rules. It's not about a bunch of rules. You know, we were talking about this morning in Sunday school about, you know, living, practical. We were talking about doing and transforming life change. The Bible is not a bunch of rules. It's, it's the word of God that guides and leads you. When we become a believer, it becomes a way of life. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, it becomes a way of life. And you begin to thank God for changing your way of life. I mean, financially, it's a big blessing because you used to just spend money doing some crazy stuff and now you realize, man, I don't need all that stuff. And then you start being a blessing to someone else. Places that we used to go, we don't go there anymore. God begins to change us. So the first thing I want us to look at for those three things is the living water that Jesus gives is a gift, not something you must earn or qualify for. But whoever drinks of this water I will give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of spring. Springing up eternal life. It's a gift, not a reward. We can't work for it. We can't work for salvation. We can't work. No, we do work as believers. We got to get on the firing line. We got to disciple folks. We got to share the gospel. That's a different work. And working for our salvation. We, we can't. The gospel is the good news. And it would not be the good news if we do penance for our sin just to get. It wouldn't be the good news. It wouldn't. Because that would be working. The next thing is no sinner is excluded from the offer of this gift. No one is excluded. He said, all, for God so loved the world, everyone, and no one is excluded. In the eyes of most Jews, including the disciples at this point, this woman was not worthy of Jesus' time. Because we go through the story, they marveled, they puzzled that Jesus even talked to her as a Samaritan woman. If you keep going through the story, actually it's often good religious people who exclude themselves from receiving this gift. You know, Many times I have shared the gospel with folks and they said, I'm good. I'm good. You've heard it before. People tell you, I said it before myself. I'm good. I mean, I go to church, you know, Easter, Christmas, and the other few, my family dragged me before I know the Lord. So I'm good. I'm doing my stuff, you know. Even though I don't go to church, I might drive by and drop some tithe money off, some offering. I'm good. I'm doing those things. So I know I'm good. I don't curse. I don't steal. I don't do this, 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 this. We start to justify comparing, going through all this stuff, but your heart's still not right because you have not received the gift of eternal life. 
And the third one is the gift of living water that Jesus offers satisfied thirsty souls for time and eternity. We get thirsty daily and we drink to quench our thirst. But the water that Jesus gives, that metaphor that he used, the spirit of God, he quenches our spiritual thirst. He helps us to grow, to walk, to learn. He guides us, he leads us. In times of pain, he comforts us. In times of need, he provides. Not the wants, sometimes he does, but it's the needs. We got to be careful of that. In John 7, 37, it says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost beings will flow a river of living water. Living water. The spirit of God begins to flow through you. Where you begin to share the word of God with others. Where, you know, you're not holding on to those bitterness. You begin to let go. You'll be able to forgive. You'll be able to heal. And many of the Jews were familiar with this scripture. They knew the Lord himself is a spiritual fountain of living water. Because all through the Old Testament, we see that in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 2.13, the Lord rebuked his sinners, the sinning people. For my people have committed two evil, he said. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. To you for themselves, sister and broken, that can hold no water. He's talking about seeking those other things to satisfy what only God can satisfy. Seeking those things to quench the spiritual thirst that only God can quench. But Jesus told that woman that he gives what becomes in him a well. Springing up eternal life. Let's turn in our Bible. Back to John 4.15. Jesus said, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. See, after Jesus talked with her and he shared with her, she realized she had a need and she asked him, she said, give it to me, sir, give it to me. This morning, Jesus is saying to you, I am the living water. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Will you ask him to come into your heart? Would you ask him to come and quench your thirst this morning? See, you must ask for the gift of living water. He's not going to shove it on you. He's going to seek you out. And he's going to offer it to you. But you have to make a decision. You have to receive it for yourself. You have to ask him to come into your heart. You can't just, well, you know... God is God, so he's going to do his thing. Oh, I got the water. No, you got to ask for it. She said, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst again. It's a gift, not a reward. These words will provoke our curiosity about three things. And I want us to look at that. To receive the gift, you need to know what it is. Jesus talked with her. He shared with her. You have to know what this gift is that you're getting. To receive the gift of God, you must know who Jesus is. See, many people don't receive Jesus because they don't see a need for this guy named Jesus. You know, I was joking with somebody and they were being religious at a situation. So I said, why do I need Jesus? She said, no, you're not in Mexico. <laughs> and we were joking about something we were talking. And so the person was trying to do something like what she was doing. And, but... I, t I reminded her, you have to receive it for yourself, man. You can't live off your grandmother, Jesus. You can't live off your parents, Jesus. You can't live off your parents' experience. You can't live off your husband or your wife's um, um, experience. You have to experience Jesus Christ for yourself because you're going to stand before him by yourself. You're not going to be with your spouse, your mom, your dad, not going to stand and justify for you. So we have to know, the woman needed to know something about this one who claims that he would give her living water to underscore the fact that faith is not blind leap in the dark. Faith is only as good as its object. To have faith, you need to know that it has flaws recently. 
You know, it's like a plane taking off. We have faith the plane is going to lift off and it's going to land. But we also know that it just came in, so it flew. Right? We have that because it just came in, they clean it, we get on, and we fly. To have faith in Christ, you need to know something about who he is. You need to know who Jesus Christ is. And the third one is to receive the gift of living water. Just ask. You just got to ask. 410, if you would have asked, I would have given you the living water. To ask Jesus, you have to recognize that you have a need. That you are thirsty. That you are hungry. But if you come to Jesus and ask, he will give it. All you have to do is be yourself. Drink. Take and receive. You know, we sing that one song. Leave it all behind and come to the world. I love that song. Because a lot of times we want to come to Jesus and we want to bring all of it with us. And then when we leave, we take it up and we walk away with it. But the song said, leave it all behind and come to the well. All who thirsty, all who hunger, just come. And you will find what your soul longs it for. It longs for Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can satisfy your soul. And one drink will transform your life for eternity. You taste and you will see that the Lord is good. But for many, we are running on empty. You know, the last few months, I've been trying, and even for the believers, as we're navigating this pandemic and everything that's going on, we're making changes. We have to wear the mask. We don't want to wear the mask. We have to social distance. We want to hug where we can't. We try to fist bump. We're trying to do all these things. We're trying to get, it can be frustrating, you know? Parents are navigating do I quit my job so I can homeschool my kids? Or do I make a decision to send my kids to school with a possibility they might get this disease or this? And we're just going back and forth. But Jesus refreshes us, those who are believers, with his words. He encourages us with his word. You see, once we've tasted, he refreshes us. He comforts us. He gives us wisdom to make those decisions. This morning, some of us are running on empty. And we need to be refreshed. But for some, you have never tasted. You have never received that living water. This morning, will you ask Jesus for the living water this morning? Will you allow him to come into your life this morning? You know, sometimes we want to accept that water. But we are afraid of what? someone is going to say or what people are going to say or they, res they respond to us because they knew our life before and we talk a little bit about that in Sunday school this morning in Ephesians talking about that change he said for you were once this woman didn't worry about what people said she said give me that water and then she ran back to the village and she said come Come see a man. You see, that's what the water will do. It will spring up inside of you and give you boldness. So you won't be afraid. It will give you boldness to share the word of God. You say, well, I don't, I don't talk to people. It will give you boldness to go to a perfect stranger and say, let me tell you about a man. The man Christ Jesus. It will give you boldness to forgive those who have hurt you, those who are close to you. It will give you boldness to stand with a sister or brother in their times of need and put your arms around them and let them know that God is still on the throne in the midst of this circumstance and he will comfort you and he's walking with you.